What I want to talk about today, and I've done this a couple times here at this church, um, and uh, probably three times, I believe, is either do the last message for the year or the new one for the new year. And I look back, and uh, I did some supply preaching. Very first time I came to the, this church and preached, it was the first Sunday in, in 2014. And uh, so this is like the third or the fourth time, I guess. But um, glad y'all could be here. If you have your Bibles open to Proverbs chapter 3. The sermon is what to expect in 2022. Now, if you're expecting me to give you some very, very specific news, I'm not. Like maybe, Rusty, you're going to come into a lot of money. Okay, that you would be happy with that. Promise? Well, no, no. But the new year is six days away. Actually, next Saturday. Six short days. I want to talk about the past. I want to talk about the future. And I want to read what God's word has to say and how we are to follow him. Proverbs chapter 3. These are the words of King Solomon to his son. But the words to his son apply to us today. Keep that in mind. Proverbs chapter 3. My son, do not forget my law. And really he's talking about the Torah. He's not talking about himself as king. But as what God's word says. But let not... Excuse me, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the, on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, today... Lord, we reflect on the immediate past and we look towards with anxiousness the new year and what that holds, the excitement of that, Lord. The question is, Father, do we understand that if you lead us with your Holy Spirit, can we have a closer walk with you, a closer relationship, and Lord, we pray that, that we will, if we trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lord, thank you for the blessings. Thank you for each person here. For it's in Christ's name, I pray. So let's talk about the past. Go back to 2019. Before we even heard the word COVID. Think about that. That was the last year. That is our benchmark for being normal and how the media used that word normal and getting back to normal. 2019, that's it. Because in the early part of 2020, we start hearing and reading about a virus. And time goes by, day after day after day, that drum beat that this is going to be big echoed throughout the country. 
some of us said this is the flu like any other flu. A lot of people said, no, it's not. It impacted this church on Sunday, March 15th. It's the last time we met together. And then out of an abundance of caution, we prayed and the staff and church leadership decided it's time to do something different. So we preached to a camera on a phone on live stream until Mother's Day, May 10th. And we said, that's it. We're not doing this anymore. And we came together as a church again. And we have not broke fellowship since then. Keep in mind, a lot of churches still to this day are not meeting in person or they're doing live stream 100%. I know of at least two churches personally that are still doing live stream. They do not meet as a congregation. That's their choice. That is their choice, what they decide. But for this church, this is what we're doing. Now, we've been criticized for that. So be it. We have to do what God leads us to do. It's not our ego. It's not our pride. It's not anything as staff. We have to look out what's best for our church family and lead them properly with wisdom. And that is what Solomon is teaching his son. Now, we don't know the age of the son, but I can tell you Solomon only lived 60 years. So at some point, his son is learning about life which is important. Every father teaches his son about life, about how to treat people, how he should treat women, how he should work and have a strong work ethic, how he should be a good citizen and obey the laws of the land. Provide and protect his family. As a father, as a husband, that is our number one job. And scripture puts one more caveat to that for us as believers. As a husband, I am to love my wife. And if I love my wife, my family knows it. And it makes a difference in my children's life and my grandchildren. He's telling his son, you're going to live this life and there's going to be heartache. There's going to be problems. There's going to be difficulties. And we all do it the same. But if you draw close to God, trust in God with all your heart, your soul, and your spirit, your life is going to make a difference in those around you, starting with your family, starting with your friends, your church, the place you work, your neighbors. Trust God in all things and walk accordingly. Now, I'm going to go back to Scripture a little bit here. I mentioned in the verse 1, it's God's law. If we only, only, only in this country could follow God's law and how we treat people, what a difference this world would be. 
What a difference our culture would be if we didn't lie, steal, cheat, kill. I did some research. I think you would agree with me. Brother Gordon preached on this several Sundays ago about Jesus being the light that has come, that pushes back the darkness. I researched on the FBI website that crime rose 5.6% this year over last year at this time. And these are brand new statistics, by the way. Something is going on in this country. We know what it is. But the people who do not know God, they just think it's politics. They just think it's, if we could only change the laws, if we could only do this, we could only do that, we would live in utopia. The hippies tried it in the 60s and the 70s, and it did not work. All it did was create more problems. And yet, all these dreamers that come along and said, if we could only get rid of capitalism. But they are foolish enough not to study history and see what socialism and communism has done to other countries and how many lives that were lost because of it. He will say in verse 2, for the length of days and long life and peace will they will add to you. In the Hebrew, he is saying you will have a life worth living. Oh my gosh, folks. Do you believe your life is worth living apart from God? It's because you and I have tasted that, like 1 Peter says. We've been given a taste of the Holy Spirit. We understand God, and we're striving to understand God day by day by day. But there are still those that are in darkness that do not understand what it's like to walk with God. There are opportunities and challenges coming up. I said 2019 was the last normal year. 2020, we had lockdowns. We had health issues. We had financial issues. We had people laid off without work, which caused other problems in the home. Addictions. Marital and child abuse. Arrest were up in family violence. Sometimes we look out and everything is clear. And if we just say, if people would follow God, as Solomon is telling his son, son, I love you. And I want the best for you in your life. To do that, you're going to have to do certain things. Notice in those eight verses I read to you, the odd number verses are something his son has to do. And that could be us. The even number verses are the blessings that God will do. In other words, he's saying, if you do this, God will do that. If you do this, God will do that. Solomon, according to 1 Kings 3.12, was the wisest man who ever lived at that time or will ever live. And this is him at his best teaching his son of what the future holds in store. 
but it applies to us today. It applies to us because we can take these same words that God has given us and we can claim them for ourselves and our walk with Christ. Because the problem is, as we remember when we were lost, and for some of us, that's not that long ago, we walked in darkness with a carnal mind, not knowing God and certainly not following God. Solomon wants to make a tangible, real difference in his son's life. Look at verse 5 again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What he's talking about is your total commitment to walk in faith with God. And don't lean into your own understanding. In other words, don't be your own counselor. Allow the word of God to come alive in your soul. I mentioned just a minute ago, during the lockdowns, during the pandemic, during so much uncertainty that crime rose, people stopped going to church, people started to do what they see is best in their life. Not everyone, some but that caused problems, a ripple effect. And that led to domestic problems. It also led to health problems with addiction, and it certainly led to depression. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Depression is the aftermath of a storm through the soul caused by something that completely changes that person's life. A good shake. If they don't trust God, it is tough for them to get back on the right path. It's real. It's as real as it gets, folks. And Solomon is telling his son, trust me. Son, I love you. I want the best for you. I want you to have things in life that perhaps the wisest and wealthiest man at one time on planet Earth had, but he still gave wisdom to his son. Look at verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. We fear God and nothing else. Now, Brother Paul, wow, you just said fear God and nothing else. What does that mean? We fear God because of respect for who he is. He is an awesome, powerful, merciful, gracious, just God. Our fear is not to hide and shake. Our fear is to respect and give him everything that is due him as the creator of the universe. There are two types of fear with other people. One is called servile, and it just means that you have a fear that someone is going to come and conquer you or capture you and you have to serve them or there will be consequences to it. It's the, the impression and where that comes from is if you're a prisoner and you don't want to see a certain person walking up to your cell because that certain person could torture you or even execute you. So you live in fear if you ever see that certain person. The second type of fear is filial. That is a fear 
of being disciplined by a loving parent. I think most of us can identify that. I'll use myself as I feared out of respect for my parents when they disciplined me because I knew in my heart that they loved me and they wanted what was best for me, but not to punish me for punishment's sake. Does that make sense? So when my father or my mother dis disciplined me, it doesn't mean that I understand or agree with the punishment or the discipline. But I know that they have what's best for me at stake here. And I love them and they love me. That's how it is with God. God will discipline us because he wants what's best for us. He sees the future for each of us and he wants the best. Solomon is telling his son to trust God because God will direct his path and give him the best things, the best counsel, the best blessing. And yes, there's going to be some discipline along the way because we have sin. And sin is a major factor of what's going wrong in this world because it's broken, it's corrupted. We don't trust other things. We don't trust governments. We don't trust money. We don't trust possessions. We don't trust circumstances or the word I don't like to use in my vocab vocabulary, luck. We trust God. Some of us do, some of us don't, but that's where we are as a society. Now, Solomon wrote this proverb in hopes that his son would obey and listen to him and take that wise counsel. We don't know what the son did, if, if he ever did follow his father's advice. And it's a little evangelistic. The passage is, is saying to trust God and have a relationship with God that will change your life. That is by definition what evangelism has done for each of us who are born again. We were going our way, doing our thing. There may be a God, there may be many gods or no God and we're doing what we want to do but at some point the Holy Spirit convicted us and we changed our mind repentance which is what that Greek word means is to change your mind if you change your mind and you come to your senses and you do see the light you know you're walking the wrong way and you turn and you walk the right way to God. Solomon is saying, son, walk with God, and you'll never regret it. You're going to regret problems that you have caused. You may regret relationships that you got involved with that you shouldn't have gotten involved with. And man, oh man, oh man, this guy ought to know the definition of bad relationships. 700 wives, 300 concubines. How much problems can he get into? You've dug your own grave, Solomon. You ask for problems in the palace and in your kingdom because those wives have family, those wives have problems that they bring into that relationship. And you are welcoming that into your life. So apparently Solomon snaps out of this enough to give wisdom to his son 
in saying, don't do what I did. Trust God and walk with God, and your life is going to be richer spiritually. That speaks to us today, that if we walk with God, we don't have to have New Year's resolutions. We can start today. Don't have to wait till next Saturday. And by it, let's be honest. How many had a New Year's resolution last January, and how far did you get with it? It's kind of become an American joke. When I was a kid, I took that serious. And I remember I had a resolution. I told my mother. I think I probably made it a couple weeks. I'll tell you what it is. And I was probably eight or nine. Told her I'd be a better son. And I wouldn't cause her any problems. I took it serious for a couple, three weeks. But you know what? The idea of doing something better than what you have done before. That's God. That's God. The Holy Spirit is teaching us every day. The question is, how much do we want to give of ourselves to the Holy Spirit? Do we want to be all in? Or do we want to tiptoe back and forth between two worlds? That's our decision. It's our life. God has given us that freedom because God did not create robots or puppets. Our free will lets us do those things. <clears throat> Let me read a couple things here. I mentioned statistics a while ago, and I mentioned fear. And I wrote these down because I'm going to quote them exactly the way I got them. According to the Pew Research, and I use Pew Research and Barner Group and a couple others, uh, Lifeway, uh, for certain polls, surveys, been doing that 20 years, I bet. Uh, very good information. And it looks like this from the Pew Research, and this is recent as of like last week, the survey taken of adults in America, the percentage, get this, the percentage of American Christians has fallen about 12% over the last 10 years, from 75% in 2011 to 63% today. In 10 years, 12% of those surveyed aren't Christians. That number is going down instead of going up. I was surprised with this one from the survey. That in 2022, uh, 21, the number who pray every day is 45%. That's astonishing. And prayer over your meal does not count. I'm sorry. That's, that's receiving a blessing from God and returning that with thanks. That's great that we do that. But true prayer is communication, communication with God and getting in your private room, closet, or wherever and speaking with God and listening to God. Now, check this one out. The demographic rising in its place. In other words, the loss of that 12% of the population that is not saying they're Christian anymore. 
the new category, and I gave this to this church about three years ago, are the nuns. N-O-N-E-S. What does that mean? Those with no religious connection at all. They're not atheists. They're not agnostic. They're not Hindu or Muslim or Jewish or Christian. They don't have anything to do with anything religious. That group grew to 20% of the population this year. 20%, one out of five people, up from 16% in 2017. My, my, my. If that was only Christians getting saved year by year, what a difference. We're going the wrong way. Now, this one you're going to really appreciate because I know Mary and Brother Gordon and I. In June of 2020, keep in mind, June of 2020, we're still in the early part of the pandemic. Okay, Christway, we've made our adjustment to live stream and then back. Okay, so keep that in perspective. In June of 2020, 96% of pastors said they offered live stream services, which is great. 96% of the churches identified with live stream now, and maybe they had it before. Or maybe they didn't, like us. And we said, we're going to do this. 96% of the pastors responded that they had live streamed. And that same survey said, are you ready for this? Probably no surprise. 48% of regular attendees tuned in. In other words, they stopped going. They were regular attendees in church. They stopped going to in-person church, stayed home, and 48% of them tuned into live stream. 48%. How come that's not 100%? Do you understand that? People that were in full-time attendance when the pandemic, pandemic hit stayed home, and of those full-time attendant people in church, 48%, only 48% used live stream. That means they didn't tune in, they didn't do anything with their church. Or, or, that other 50 per, 52% is made up of people somewhere else. By the way, people all around the world watch this service. We have the metrics in our uh, live stream software. We know where people watch it, and uh, it's fascinating. Tens and tens of thousands of people watch Christ Way because... Doesn't mean they watch it while it's happening. They watch it later during the week. It's, it's just fascinating. But here's the bad news. Today, even with services back to normal in some parts of the country, in-person attendance is 30 to 50% of what it was before the pandemic. What does that mean, Brother Paul? Before the pandemic, go back to 2019, our normal year. Any one church in America, the average attendance is usually 20, 25% of the total church membership. In other words, one out of five or one out of four 
of the church membership will be in attendance on Sunday morning worship. We have 506 full-time resident members of this church. You can look around, do the math. Now, they have reason, and that's their reason, and that's between them and God. But it hurts if a church family isn't together and working together to serve God. They're missed. They're missed up here in the talent that they bring with worship. They're missed, missed out there. They're missed during the week with ministry opportunities that staff cannot cover. Trust the Lord in all things and let him direct your paths. And here, one last thing on this survey. Outside of the Western world, America, let's say, the church is growing, is, is growing at incredible rate. Africa, China, South America, other places are growing because of the underground church that is facing persecution in difficult places, including the Middle East. You just don't hear about it because of security. And we want missionaries to be safe. Meanwhile, in America, y'all do whatever y'all want kind of attitude. Let's take God out of school. Let's take God out of the marketplace. Let's take God out of our society. And this is more than just politics, people. At some point, we've crossed over the threshold that this is not Democrats or Republicans. It's not politics. I want to be honest with you. It's good and evil. And that is what is ahead of us. So the question I have for you, and I'm going to close right now with it, is that, what does 2020 have in store? Well, beginning next Sunday, we have 52 Sundays to come and worship God. There are 8,860 hours to be lived in 2022. Take away eight hours for sleep. And you've got 5,740 hours. And what you do with those waking hours is up to you and me and anyone else that is a Christian in America. Question is, are you going to spend it in Bible study, in prayer, in fellowship? Or are you going to do that? Now, we know we got to work. We understand all of that. So discount that. But the question is, are we pulling closer to God as Solomon's wisdom shared with his son? Are we pulling away or are we just stuck in neutral? Guess what? Every individual believer has to decide that. We have to take our own spiritual inventory. I mentioned a while ago about verse 7 in fear. Well, let me ask you this. This is important. Do we fear failure, people, challenges, change, criticism, rejection of sharing the gospel with the lost, embarrassment? What, what is our fear? Because when I read the word of God, I just need to fear him. Not that he's going to punish me, but he will discipline me when I sin. But I have a healthy respect for my heavenly father like I had a healthy respect for my earthly father. Different, obviously, 
They both have the best in mind for me. I'll be honest. I've seen a lot. I think 2022 is going to be another mixed bag of opportunities and challenges. For some people, it may be a repeat of 2021. It may be totally different. But what we have to decide, you and me, as born-again believers, we're going to pull closer to God. This church will pull closer to God. There are people that should be here today that need to be pulling closer to God in their walk. There are people coming in 2022 that you and I don't know yet. They're going to visit this church, join this church, get baptized in this church, and the opportunity and the blessing is maybe that's someone you love. The challenge is we have spiritual warfare. And the devil will keep everything at his, in his arsenal to keep us away from God. And once we're saved, he can't undo that. But he can come at us to discourage us and cause us to doubt our salvation. He'll do it to every one of us. What are we going to do about it? What? can we expect in 2022? Guess what? We get to find out come Saturday and we live day by day to see where God is in our lives.